Thank you very much. Yeah, so as it has just been said, uh, we're gonna go a bit off topic compared to the title of the school and get our hands dirty. Um, <clears throat> so as you might or might not know, when you talk to experimentalists, many of them uh, think that we are full of crap to, to be interested in such a problem. But the only reason uh, is that no one explained to it to them properly. So a good fraction of the talk will be dedicated just to stating the problem in a modern effective field theory way that will make no reference to quadratic divergences that are magical and do not exist. So that next time you meet an experimentalist, you can tell them, no, you are the one that is full of crap. Um, <clears throat> so this will be kind of the central part of the talk. And after that, uh, I will tell you about uh, a few solutions that emerged recently, a few other solutions that are kind of more classical and what the impact of experiment on them has been. And this is roughly is gonna be an account of all the elegant and not so elegant ways in which you can fail in theoretical physics. Um, okay, but before uh, getting to that, um, I would like to start with two, in some sense, historical examples. Um, that should make clear why uh, we think that the hierarchy problem is deep and worth thinking about at such length. Um, one very classic example of tuning in classical physics is that of the electron self-energy. <clears throat> so you might ask, uh, what's the electron rest energy? And it's, it's, it's mass, you can measure it quite precisely. Let me write it bigger. And you know that this number is roughly alpha and MeV. And of course, uh, throughout the lectures, I'm, I'm gonna use natural units. <clears throat> and then, uh, at this point, uh, you might uh, wonder how to compute it and compare these measurements with your predictions. And of course, there's gonna be a contribution from some bare Lagrangian parameter. And then, in classical electrodynamics, there's going to be the energy stored in the electric field generated by the electron itself. Which is of this size. So now, I'm going to cheat a little bit for the sake of making the point and tell you that we know the electron size roughly up to 100 GeV. Assuming that we still have classical knowledge of electrodynamics, but we have lab-type knowledge of the electron size. So this just comes from having collided electrons at these energies and not having seen any constituents come out. The actual best limit right now might be better, but that doesn't matter. This is, way, this is more than enough uh, to understand what the problem is. Because if you plug this number back here, you immediately see that uh, to get the experimental value, you need a huge cancellation. So this quantity here is going to be of the order of 10 to the 5 MeV. And somehow, it has to cancel against something else to an accuracy of alpha and MeV. A priori, there is no real physical problem because you cannot measure directly this parameter, but it's very disturbing that there is such an accidental cancellation in a physical system. And this feeling of unease, if you go and uh, explore nature experimentally <clears throat> in a more clever way, translates into something very surprising. So you know <clears throat> that uh, if you go too close uh, to this kind of scales, quantum mechanics is going to start to play a role. And in this problem, precisely around uh, a radius of uh, roughly of one over the electron mass, you're gonna have quantum, quantum effects become important. And then if you do the computation properly and not in classical electrodynamics, you're gonna get that this contribution to the self-energy is canceled by the appearance of the positron, and then you get just a logarithmic correction and the tuning goes away. <clears throat> 
And the way I got this number is very simple. It's just the usual uh, uncertainty principle. So restoring units for a second, all I've done is the following. <clears throat> okay, so you encountered an accidental cancellation, and as a, as a result, you've discovered something very deep about nature, that uh, at some point, your classical description breaks down and a completely new paradigm kicks in. <clears throat> so this already should be enough uh, to give you a hint of why these kind of tuning problems are interesting. But let me tell you about another uh, historical example that has a completely different resolution, and uh, which is something that uh, I've stolen from a public lecture by Professor Zyberg that's going to lecture you later in the day. So, at the time of Kepler, um, planetary orbits, at least until Saturn, were kind of well known within some experimental uncertainty. And uh, in 1569, he published a treaty where uh, he showed that uh, the six orbits could be described by a beautiful symmetric model that was built by uh, putting the platonic solids one inside the other. So if you, if you do it in the right order and draw spheres around the solids, you're going to find out that within the experimental accuracy of the time, all the six planets up to Saturn sit on these spheres. You can call this an incredible coincidence from a modern perspective, or the, the, the act of God from, from, from Kepler's perspective. So you might ask now how, how, this, uh, how this incredible tuning uh, was solved, but you know the answer already. And the answer is that uh, we discovered that we're not alone, that there are many, many other systems that are just like the solar system. And these kind of accidents, even though are very unlikely, get an order one probability when you integrate over this huge amount of stars and planets out there. So you might say that the resolution of this fine tuning problem was kind of completely opposite to the electron. There is no dynamics going on. The dynamical explanation was the one by Kepler. <clears throat> but nonetheless, the impact of, uh, of this tuning problem on our understanding of the universe was just as dramatic. So we lost our central position, and we understood that the universe is very different than what we believed before. So now you've seen two examples of uh, of accidental cancellations in physics that are both uh, signaling that something very deep is going on, although in two completely different ways. And uh, I'm going to spoil you the last of the lecture by telling you that we don't know yet uh, to which one of these categories, or maybe there's a third, the hierarchy problem of the weak scale belongs to. OK, so this uh, concludes my history lesson. And now, we can get to the hierarchy problem. <clears throat> so before getting there, as I said at the beginning, we need to go through a quick review of effective field theory, which I think it's always a good thing. <clears throat> And the basic setup is the following. So imagine that you have a theory that is valid up to a little bit above some scale lambda. But your experiments can prove nature only at a much lower scale. So a very uh, reasonable question is whether the degrees of freedom up, up here influence the dynamics down here, and in which way. So you might start. Uh, in a purely formal way by just writing your path integral of your full theory. And then split up degrees of freedom into two parts. There are modes that are light, in the sense that their energy is smaller than lambda, and modes that are heavy, in the sense that their energy is larger than lambda. And this might be just Fourier components or entire fields in case they're massive. And again, purely formally, you can split the integral into these two pieces.
And at this point, you want a description just in terms of file height. You can get by redefining the action, where now, my cutoff dependent action is just the result of integrating out the heavy fields. And so far, I, have not, I, have, I haven't done anything. I mean, it's not that uh, I'm any closer to describing the experiment in terms of the light fields. But uh, by looking at this, uh, I might wonder if there is uh, a low energy picture for this Lagrangian. And in fact, there is. You can just uh, write down an infinite sum of all the local operators built with light fields that are consistent with the symmetries that you observe at this low scale. And I said local, but I lied, because since you're integrating out modes above lambda, there's also going to be operators that are non-local by an amount of 1 over lambda, which means that this is also an expansion in derivatives. But in any case, again, I haven't done anything, because I have an infinite sum, and I cannot possibly predict anything at this point. However, this is where uh, symmetry comes to the rescue. <clears throat> and you're going to see that uh, symmetries that are broken are almost are just as powerful as symmetries that are not broken. So in this case, the symmetry that we care about are dilatations and its selection rules. So clearly, dilatations might be broken in this theory, but they're th they're, we can still categorize this these operators in terms of what representation of the dilatation operator they transform into. And this is just a fancy way of saying that we can do dimensional analysis. So we set uh, h slash to 1 and c to 1. So our only dimensional full quantity left is energy. And I can classify the operators based on what's their scale in dimension. <clears throat> In order for the action to be dimensionless, given that I set h slash to 1, then I know that uh, the coefficients of these operators are going to have dimension where d is the number of space-time dimensions. And uh, since I have a large scale in the theory, I can always make an, well, not an ansatz, but I can always rewrite these coefficients in the following way. Where now the lambda i are order one numbers that, that multiply the right dimension full quantity. And notice that, again, here I have not lost generality in any way, so these gi's might uh, get contributions from many different scales. But I know that my theory is only valid up until lambda. I know that lambda is going to be the largest contribution. So at most, I'm going to get this. Maybe for symmetry reasons, the lambdas are not going to be order one, but a bit smaller. So this is just a parameterization. But with this parameterization and knowing the dimension of the operator, so now I know how each of these guys contributes to an observable at low energy. So the contribution to the action of one of the terms in this sum would be roughly scaling like this. So lambda i. Oh, sure, sorry. Yeah, so, so what's the contribution to an observable at low energy? This is just given by the contribution to the action roughly of this operator. And uh, <clears throat> it's going to go like this.
So from here, you can see that uh, based uh, <coughs> on their scaling dimension, I can classify the operators in uh, operators that have uh, dimensions larger than the, space -time, the number of space-time dimensions. And these, at low energy, are going to be suppressed by a power of the small number, the ratio of the low energy over the high scale. And so they're called irrelevant. Operators with, del with scaling dimension equal to the number of space-time dimensions are called marginal, and you can guess that uh, these guys are called relevant. So now, we have prescri prescription to do something useful with this theory, because given an experimental accuracy, we can truncate this sum at some scaling dimension, and the contributions after that are gonna be smaller than our experimental precision. So, we have a Lagrangian with a finite set of terms that allows us to make predictions after we fix the coefficients with some measurements. And uh, so this is a very nice general way of taking uh, a UV theory and getting its infrared counterpart. Or vice versa, it's also a tool, if you don't know the UV theory, to make predictions just purely based on low energy observables. So you might uh, identify a set of fields at low energy, identify the symmetries of the problem, and then just write down this expansion up to whichever order you care about. <clears throat> so this might have been already familiar to some of you, but now we're in a position um, to define the hierarchy problem properly. But uh, before doing that, I would like to show you really the power of this framework by writing down some low energy Lagrangians and asking whether they're surprising or not. Because this is another thing that this kind of uh, formalism can do for you. So if you know the symmetries and you see some set of terms, you might ask whether they make sense or not, even if you don't know the UV theory. <clears throat> but actually, before that, uh, I, I'll spend one more word to make uh, this idea more precise. And the reason is that uh, you might say, yes, this is all very nice, but uh, you haven't taken care of uh, divergences. So you might worry that uh, when I integrate out the stuff at the high scale going down and I close some loops, there might be divergences that mix operators of higher dimensions with operators of lower dimensions, and it might be that uh, all this construct is completely useless because in the end, all the operators contribute at the same order. Uh, in practice, however, there is a very simple way of making this more precise. I'm not gonna go very much into the details, but it's the usual Wilson uh, way of the renormalization group flow because you can just integrate in small momentum shells and do this step by step. And at each step, you don't have any divergences. The limit of integrations are all finite. And you'll see that in the end, you're, you're gonna get precisely this result. So what, what this step-by-step -step integration generates is a flow in the space of actions that is smooth and is precisely the normalization group flow. So given a UV theory, you can ask where the action is flowing to. Okay, so after this parenthesis, let's get uh, uh, to the power of symmetry and let's make this construction a bit less abstract and more concrete. So let's say I gave you this Lagrangian at low energy. Would you be surprised? For this, the answer is obviously no because uh, you know why there aren't any other terms. So there is just a simple shift symmetry that this scalar possess that sets to zero all the other terms. So when you, see, when you see something like this, you might ask, is there a symmetry that allows me not to write down all the other terms? And in this case, there is a very simple symmetry. So then there might be higher derivative uh, powers in this expansion, but they're gonna be suppressed by powers of the cutoff. So this one was easy. But let's say we had this. So 
So by definition, since at low energy you are seeing the scalar, the mass must be much smaller than uh, the typical scale. And again, the answer is that this action is not surprising at all. <clears throat> because this mass is breaking the shift symmetry. So if you make it very small and get to zero, you are restoring a symmetry in the Lagrangian. <clears throat> so there is a sense in which contributions to this M square are always going to be proportional to small parameters that break this symmetry. Typical in this theory, but to M itself. <clears throat> However, there is another way of seeing why this Lagrangian is not surprising, that uh, I think it's more novel and more instructive, and I heard it first uh, from Riccardo Rattazzi. So this is not uh, the only symmetry that justifies the form of this Lagrangian. There is actually an infinite tower of higher spin symmetries for the free scalar that you can see immediately if you write it in momentum space. So if you write the action in momentum space, you're going to get something like this. And uh, any rotation of the scalar of this type The alpha satisfying the following property is a symmetry of the action. And you can check that this sets to zero all higher point functions. It's very easy to, <clears throat> to check by just uh, doing this rotation. And what is nice about this symmetry is that it also gives you selection rules that we'll see it, we'll see it in a second. And it's going to tell you what powers of the coupling can enter the generation of the mass if you have any. OK, so now one more example, and then we're going to be done and get to the hierarchy problem per se. And the last one, again, our friend, uh, the scalar. But this time, I'm just going to add uh, an interaction. And uh, as you might have guessed, uh, even not from physics, but just uh, from the fact that at some point I have to give you an example that is surprising. This is surprising. <clears throat> and the reason is very simple. The reason is just that uh, this coupling is breaking the shift symmetry, is breaking this symmetry. <clears throat> so you expect a mass term and other couplings to be generated. And you can even, from the selection rules of this symmetry, predict that it's going to be generated with one power of the coupling lambda. So the typical contribution to the mass you expect is going to be generated, for example, by this diagram. It's going to scale as lambda over log loop factor times the large scale. So if you don't see a mass, at least of this order, you should be surprised. <clears throat> there is no symmetry. I mean, you might make lambda small and again go into an approximately shift symmetric limit, but nothing is protecting you from generating a mass of this order. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, this is precisely the case uh, with the standard model. So the problem is not just free scalars in general with a mass smaller than the cutoff, but it's with interacting scalars with a mass much smaller than the cutoff. So if you write the standard model Lagrangian, or at least the part relevant to the problem, you're going to have something like this. Actually, this is enough. So from the argument you just made, we just made, we expect uh, contributions to the mass at this order. 
whatever the scale up to which the standard model is valid is, but also contributions of this order. So if you want to extrapolate the standard model up to M Planck or the GAT scale, you're going to immediately hit a wall because these couplings are both order one. They're, well, at least the, the top two couple has been measured. And so you might wonder what is going on. So clearly our decimetry is broken enough to generate a mass that is much larger than the weak scale if you want to extrapolate the standard model to very high energies. And this is the hierarchy problem. So there are no quadratic divergences, no nothing. There is only symmetry and some physical scale. So you might think that this physical scale is very close to us. It's approximately the weak scale so that you're going to get the right contribution to the X mass. More precisely, you might expect that lambda is of the order of 4 pi and X, so a few TV. <clears throat> So here comes the problem. It was very easy to state once we introduced the framework of effective theory. But uh, uh, I want to show it to you yet in another way by, <clears throat> by showing you that where, where the cancellation really comes from. So this was all very nice based on symmetry and simple. But let's take a concrete example of something living at this scale and see how it affects the X mass. So let's say that uh, I have a theory valid up to some large mass plus a small increment. And this theory looks roughly like the standard model. So again, we have our worst scalar. And then we have a Yukawa with some heavy fermion. <coughs> Can you still see? Or is it too small? Okay. Okay, so at this high scale m plus some small incremental dm, we have the equivalent of the standard model, so a toy representation with an heavy fermion and a scalar. Okay, so now let's say I want to do what Wilson did and integrate out small momentum shells one after the other until I get to the weak scale or the scale I'm making a measurement at. And I'm gonna start by integrating out the shell between m plus delta m and m minus delta m. So what happens here is that I'm integrating out the whole of the fermion since it's massive. At three level, you can check immediately by looking at its equation of motion that is not going to contribute to the Lagrangian of the scalar. But at one loop level, it's generating everything. So we're gonna have uh, some contribution to the two-point function of the scalar, some contribution to the four-point function, even six-point in points interaction, and so on. <clears throat> and we care mostly about this two-point function. We want to know what's the contribution to the mass. And you can do the usual one-loop calculation that you always see when they present you the hierarchy problem, and you're going to get something of this form. So let's say that now we are in four dimensions. Okay, so this is the usual one loop integral where the, so the quadratic divergences come from. However, now I'm integrating over a tiny momentum shell. So those that traditionally are called quadratic divergences are actually a tiny contribution of order that time squared. And what matters here is some finite threshold contribution from the mass of the heavy fermions. From, from the mass of the heavy fermion. Okay, so in the full theory, the mass of the scalar <coughs> is going to come, actually let me write down the coupling explicitly. 
the mass of the scalar is going to come from this contribution and the parameter in the Lagrangian, so in the full theory, my physical scalar mass that I can measure as the pole of the two-point function has two contributions, the Lagrangian parameter and this leading one-loop term, plus subleading terms. <coughs> And now I can match it to the effective theory. So the effective theory <laughs> below the scale at which we integrate out the fermion, just uh, what we said before. So all the operators you can write using only the scalar that are consistent with the symmetries. So in this case, everything. Let me call this M prime. Okay, so at the scale at which I integrate out the fermion, <clears throat> this M prime squared in the effective theory should match the result of the full theory. And I, kept, I can keep doing this step by step and uh, generate more and more corrections. However, if uh, this coupling is somewhat small, all these corrections that I generate until getting to low energy are going to be subleading to this first term because they're going to come from this lambda here and the loop diagrams we wrote before. But this lambda was only generated at one loop by the fermion with four powers of this small Yukawa. <clears throat> so in the limit in which this Yukawa is sufficiently small, this is all I get also at very low energy after integrating out all momentum shells. And now, here is the fine-tuning problem in all its concreteness. I mean, you can see it. So if, if the scalar still survives up until very low energies, you can measure its mass and find it to be something, say 100 GV, roughly. And then you might wonder how comes this contribution that was much larger and generated at a much higher scale cancels against this parameter that has nothing to do with it to give you this small number. So now we've seen the hierarchy problem in many different ways, just from a symmetric perspective and from this more concrete perspective of directly integrating out stuff. So I hope I've convinced you that it's just a problem of symmetries and physical scales and that now you're ready to confront your experimentalist friends. So now you, repeat all that I just said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> okay, so this concludes also part two. And, oh, God, okay, we're, I think I've been way too slow. I should have checked the clock long ago. All right, so now. But anyway, so this, this was, uh, the nice part of the talk, where you see the power of theoretical physics at work. And now we're gonna go into the painful part of the talk, where you see theoretical physics meeting experiment and failing horribly. And how much time do I still have? 25, oh, okay, okay, then, then that's much better than I thought. All right, so, <clears throat> Roughly speaking, well, I mean, there are many solutions of the hierarchy problem on the market, and you can categorize them in different ways. I'm gonna show you one possible categorization, but uh, you shouldn't take it uh, too seriously. It's just a way of organizing our ideas. So, there's a set of solutions based on symmetry. And then, a set of solutions based on the cosmological history of the universe. And these are similar to what we've seen for the electron self-energy. These are something completely new that pertain only to the hierarchy problem. And finally, there is something that I'm gonna call a not well-posed question, meaning that the hierarchy problem is not a well-posed question. And these kind of solutions are more similar to the Kepler resolution. So 
we are not uh, the only standard model out there. And uh, very roughly, the symmetry category contains, of course, supersymmetry, or comp well, yeah, let's call it composite leagues. and extra dimensions, which are the same thing, and some conformal solution to the problem, which is almost the same thing as composite and extra dimensions, but we're gonna see why it's not exactly the same thing. And then here, we have the relaxion, and we have a naturalness, and finally, here we have the multiverse, plus some tropics, and in some sense, we also have a naturalness. So you see that these categories are a bit fluid and not very precisely defined. As I said, it's just a way uh, to keep track as I speak of what we're talking about. So, <clears throat> to be completely honest, the idea of composite X is not really a symmetric solution, but is yet another solution that uh, falls outside of these categories because it's just based on an accident in some sense. So if you imagine that uh, at some very high scale, you have only marginal operators, say a gauge coupling, <clears throat> then your theory is going to flow very slowly towards the infrared, meaning that these couplings are just gonna scale logarithmically with the cutoff. And again, this is purely based on dimensional analysis, all the story I told you before about effective theories. At some point, if this theory is, not, is asymptotically free, the coupling is going to become strong and you're gonna generate a new dynamical scale. And this is roughly going to be of this order. So you might say, wonderful, I have a huge hierarchy of scales, I've generated it dynamically, I'm good to go. I'm just gonna put the X down here, I'm done. No symmetry, no nothing, very easy. QCD inspired, it already happened in nature, maybe it's gonna happen again, who knows. But then, okay, so let's put the X here. But just as in QCD, around this scale, you expect a whole zoology of stuff. You expect Romesons to show up, Baryons, uh, and maybe Pions even below, and so on. And all these particles are strongly coupled to the X, so you definitely expect to have seen them already. If nothing else, in indirect experiments, like those that measure flavor violation, or those that measure precisely parameters of the electroweak Lagrangian, like the W mass, for example. So this idea that was called Technicolor is now considered almost un unanimously dead. However, there is a small deformation, and that's why I put composite X down here in the symmetric solutions, that kind of saves it. Because you can say, okay, sure, but what if the X is really a pion of this, of this strong interacting sector? What if there is a spontaneous symmetry, like in QCD, Carroll symmetry, sorry, that there is a symmetry that is spontaneously broken, like in QCD, and then, there is some separation of scales between the, um, where the strongly interacting sectors become strongly interacting and where you find the X. Sure, that's a, definitely a possibility, and you also know roughly what this separation is, <coughs> because this, point, this symmetry is going to be explicitly broken by the couplings of the X to the standard model. So based on what we said until now, you expect to generate an X mass of the order of the largest coupling it has in the standard model, so the top Yukawa, over a loop factor times your strongly interact interacting sector scale. So since the top Yukawa is order one, you generated an hierarchy of at least four pi, so you can put uh, all these guys at a few TV and keep the X down here at, a, at 100 GV. So this all seems nice, but again, let's confront experiment one more time. So what you have here at this scale f is a complicated nonlinear Lagrangian as you usually have for pions. 
which is definitely not going to look like what I wrote down before. It's not going to look like a phi to the fourth theory. So by just writing down higher dimensional operators that you know are going to be generated by the strong dynamics, say something like this, again, purely based on our previous effective field theory arguments, or any other stuff, you know that x coupling to standard model particles are going to be affected by these operators at order d square over f square, where now v is the measured x vacuum expectation value. And then you compare this prediction with experiment. Now the LHC knows this coupling, say, at the 20, 30 percent level. And you find that you cannot possibly have the lightest X sleep appear, but you need another separation of scales. That is mild, but it's there. And there are two ways to generate this separation of scales. Either you just call it a tuning, or you add more structure. You add another symmetry. But and, and this other class of models is called little x, but it has a lot of structure. So you are, you are getting a small hierarchy out of a lot of new fields and new symmetry. So you see that uh, you start with a nice, simple idea, and then you start confronting experiment, and you build up more and more crap on top of it, to the point that when you get here, you just don't want to look at your theory anymore. And this is more or less the story with any of these solutions. At least any of these solutions that, that is on solid enough theoretical ground as to be compared with experiment, because some of them are not at all. <clears throat> okay, so this more or less concludes what I wanted to tell you <clears throat> as far as uh, this composite X goes. Now let's, let's take a look uh, somewhere else uh, into this landscape of solutions. So what about uh, the not well-posed question story? So here, I'm not gonna tell you a lot, but just uh, to get a feeling, the point is the following. So it's, it's exactly like in Kepler's case. We have a mechanism that can generate uh, many causally disconnected universes with different values of their parameters. And by many, I mean, I mean an exponentially large number, which is what we need if we want to explain uh, an hierarchy between uh, the Planck scale and the X mass, which is a big exponential number. But now, you have to wonder why do we exist in one of the very unlikely universe where the X mass is small. And here come anthropics, which until recently was the part I liked the least about this solution, but now I like even less uh, the first part. <clears throat> the reason why I didn't like the anthropic part is that uh, there are some unwavy arguments for why you cannot take the X-Web too large or too small without destroying life. Essentially, if you take it too large, the nuclei become unstable and you don't have chemistry anymore, you just have hydrogen. If it becomes too small, then the proton decays and you don't have hydrogen anymore, so it's hard to form starts. If you take the X-Mass to be positive, so zero web, some huge disaster happens, I mean, like the CMB fries chemistry and then Spallerons cancels the, cancel the baryon asymmetry, but all these statements I'm making are very dependent on not changing any other parameter in the theory. So if you change also the Yukawa couplings, for example, together with the X-Web, almost nothing happens in most of these cases. So somehow you need a model in which you're generating a universe in which essentially only the X-Web is barring. <clears throat> And if you look at the explicit models that generate this exponential number of universes, they really don't work in such an accurate way. They're just generating all possible metastable vacuum of your UV theory. So it's kind of hard to imagine a concrete model that realizes this paradigm. On the other hand, this is really the only paradigm that at the same time is addressing also the other tuning we have, which is much larger, which is the cosmological constant tuning that I'm sure you heard about. So. So right now, the energy density of our universe is dominated by this tiny number. So if you compare it to the Planck scale or whatever scale you think your theory is valid up to even the electron mass, whatever, there is a huge tuning that you have to put in the theory not to completely destroy the cosmological history of the universe as we know it. And so far, 
this idea of generating an exponentially large number of universes with different values of the parameters and then invoking the fact that uh, we are alive to justify why we live in an atypical universe is really the only way to address both these problems at the same time. So if you look at it from a very low energy perspective, you're writing down an incredibly simple theory. One, uh, one of the best known example is split supersymmetry. You just have supersymmetric partners at a few hundred TV that gives you gauge coupling unification, a dark matter candidate. You have no problem at all comparing with experimentals in these cases. And then chaotic inflation generating all these universes plus some form of the anthropic principles tells you why these parameters are small. Okay, so in my very, very personal opinion, this, is, uh, this looks appealing because it's still very far away from us because we haven't even started writing down concrete models of how this game is gonna look like. It's like when a very ugly person is walking towards you, so long as they are one kilometer away, you don't know they're ugly, but sooner or later they're gonna approach you enough that you realize they are probably worse than your friends that you didn't like before. Okay, but... I want to stress that this is a very personal opinion and other people think definitely otherwise, among which, distinguished among which is Nima that lectured you a few days ago. Okay, so this concludes uh, my, my list of insults to the multiverse, which brings me to uh, cosmology. And then if we have time, I'm gonna go through the rest. So both of these uh, solutions that I've called cosmological have been uh, proposed in recent years, in the last couple of years. And the reason is very simple, and it's that uh, you have to relax a lot your aesthetic criteria. So <clears throat> they're also very ugly, but they're ugly in a precise way, unlike the multiverse, so I can, I can tell you exactly why they're ugly. And I personally think that uh, ugliness is not a good criterion in theoretical physics. I mean, so far, it has not, beauty has not really guided us very well. I mean, the standard model is kind of a random uh, <clears throat> addition of components that have nothing to do with each other. There are some random gauge groups, some fermion masses that spy five orders of magnitude. There are a lot of parameters that we don't understand. Maybe one day they will all merge into something beautiful and, and, and complete, but we don't know yet. So since experiments keep killing our beautiful ideas, maybe the solution is not so beautiful and comes from something completely different. The reason why uh, these solutions are, what are worth, worthy of attention is also because in spite of looking a bit artificial, they are very deep in the sense that they link the hierarchy problem to something that a priori has nothing to do with it, which is the cosmological history of the universe. So they have very spectacular consequences for experiments. <clears throat> and they, are, they, they truly represent a change of paradigm. They don't even fit into the previous examples of solutions to tuning problem that we had. So no matter how ugly you find them, I think they're worthy of your time at least to realize what, what kind of thing they are. And uh, I think I'm gonna tell you about unnaturalness because I'm one of the, let's say proud, but maybe not so proud authors. <clears throat> so in unnaturalness, you imagine that you have many copies of the standard model. and each one has a different value of the x mass. We further imagine that zero is not special at all, so we have both sectors that have a positive x mass squared in the Lagrangian, and sectors that have a negative x mass squared in the Lagrangian. So this means that in these sectors, the x map is zero, and this is different from zero. Here, fermions are almost massless, but not exactly massless, because electroweak symmetry breaking is, is Sorry, let me see is triggered by QCD, so you're gonna expect some masses of the order of lambda QCD cube over mx squared for the fermions, and for the gauge bosons, you expect masses of order lambda QCD. So it's a very different universe compared to us. Many weird things happen, as I said, but 
I want to stress that this is not a multiverse. So all these sectors exist, are part of our Lagrangian. You can write only one Lagrangian, they're all gravitationally coupled to us, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> these sectors are very similar to us, and then as you take the x web uh, larger and larger, things start happening, but that uh, is not that important for now. So <clears throat> I've imagined the existence of these sectors. Now I have to tell you what's the distribution of the x mass squared. And I'm gonna take the distribution of the x mass squared parameter to be uniform. And the reason is that uh, if I take it peak close to zero, I'm cheating. I'm not really solving the problem with this mechanism, but I'm imagining that there is some extra dynamics that is helping me. If I do the opposite, I'm, of course, uh, have to explain why the x would be peak somewhere else. So I'm just gonna imagine that we have a uniform distribution for the x mass squared parameter which means that uh, for a theory that is valid up to some scale lambda, you naturally expect the lightest of these X bosons to be roughly at lambda over the square root of the number of sectors. And here you already see the problem because even if you want lambda to be, say, a, a very miserable 10 TV, you need the 10 to the four standard models. So if you want, now you can leave the room, but if you don't leave the room, I'm gonna go on and tell you that uh, if you really wanna solve the problem all the way to, the, to where gravity becomes strong, then you need uh, 10 to the 16 sectors, because in this case, what happens, is, <coughs> sorry, what happens is the following. G Newton is renormalized by this huge amount of stuff, and uh, gravity is becoming strong at the intermediate scale, so roughly, 10 to the 11 GV. And at the same time, this 10 to the 16 is bringing the naturalness cutoff of the theory to the same scale. So this is, in a sense, a full solution of the problem. However, if uh, you know something about uh, the CMB, you know that they haven't really solved the problem and this model is awfully excluded. Because we know, for example, from the measurement of uh, Hubble at the time of flux scattering, that we dominate the energy density of the universe. So there is not much stuff out there that is gravitationally coupled to us, which can be phrased more precisely in terms of the effective number of neutrinos at the time of the CMB, which is roughly one half, which means that you can roughly accommodate alpha standard model neutrino. And I've just told you that I'm adding 10 to the 16 full standard models. So now, now there is an obvious answer to this, which is, let's say that uh, at some point in the history of the universe, there is an inflaton that couples only to us, so it decays only to us after inflation, and it populates only our sector. But again, this is not a solution to the hierarchy problem, because now you have to explain why the lightest sector is also the, the only one that couples to the inflaton. So you have to save yourself without making our settle special in any possible way. But it turns out, and this is the only part I truly like about this, this whole business, that there is a way of doing it. And the best part is that, that this way is possible at all only because there exist operators that generate the problem in the first place. So, the only reason why I can write down a viable model of reading the universe is that in the standard model, you can write down relevant operators with a combination of X bosons that is a singlet, so, or even also marginal operators of this type. And the way I'm gonna solve the problem is by imagining that at some point, so there is inflation, say, then the inflaton decays to some Gauge, gauge singlet of all the gauge groups of all these sectors that dominates the energy density of the universe, and then in turn decays to all our sectors via one of these two relevant or marginal couplings. <clears throat> and now let's make another assumption, which is where the true ugliness comes in, and which is the fact that you want the mass, let, let's focus on this model, for example. So now let's take the mass of this guy to be smaller than the mass of the lightest X. And of course, I mean, you can uh, 
you can imagine constructions that give you this, right? You can imagine that these are all brains in an extra dimension, and uh, the guy lives, so, I mean, yeah. So in the fermion case, it's easier. So you can imagine that this is the Dirac fermion, and the, one of the two vial components lives in the bulk, but uh, the other one lives on a brain, and then you're going to get a volume suppression for its mass that is precisely of the order of, the, of square root of n. So, so there are ways of doing this. Or in the case of the scalar, you can imagine that, uh, again, you have uh, a tower of scalars just like this, and then they all decay to the lightest one before the lightest one decays to us. So there are ways. They're not pretty, but there are ways. But what happens if you, if you postulate this? Then in the effective theory that describes the reheating of all the sectors from these gauge singlets, there is no X anymore. You have to integrate out. And you might ask, what operators can I write down with lighter standard model fields and this guy that treat the universe? And this is very simple. Of course, you can write some Yukawa coupling, say, to be B bar. But then what do you expect the coefficients to be here? So <clears throat> this coupling here is breaking a shift symmetry on phi. So again, by selection rules, you have to have it here in front. But you can immediately notice by looking at this operator that this coupling is dimensionful. So in four dimensions, scalars have, have dimension one. So this guy also has to have dimension one, which means that you need a scale, sorry, down here to restore dimensions. And in the effective theory, the only scale you have is the X mass itself. So you're going to generate this operator, plus there is yet another symmetry, which is the chiral symmetry of the fermions, that you know is broken by the Yukawas and the X web, so you need a Yukawa up here. So this is the leading operator that you can generate in sectors in which you do have electroweak symmetry breaking. And you're generating it just by mixing of phi with the X to its bed. However, in sectors where you don't have electroweak symmetry breaking, this contribution is obviously zero, because here what you really have to think about is something like this, right? Because the spurion that is allowing for this operator is really the X web. And so in these other sectors, it turns out that the leading operator is something like this, where F is the field strength of one of the gauge bosons, actually all of them, which is generating that one loop to this diagram. And again, where these are the X and this is phi. So again, you can do the trick of dimensional analysis as before, and you know that this has to scale like this. And this is very nice. So I've uh, added uh, a very simple operator to all the standard models. And now I have a natural way of populating the most the sectors that are the lightest. Because from these effective operators here, you can see immediately that the decays of phi into sectors with electroweak symmetry breaking are going to scale like mhi squared. And the sectors without electroweak symmetry breaking, they're going like mhi to the fourth. So I've coupled all the sectors in the same way. I haven't cheated, but I'm getting much more energy density into our sector. What's even better is that these Yukawas give you some natural protection from the UV, because as the, as the X-Web grows, also the masses of the leptons grow. So at the beginning, you might be able to decay to BB bar, but after a few sectors, you have to decay to CC bar, so you're going to have a C Yukawa suppression and so on. <clears throat> So there is a way of truly solving the hierarchy problem without making a special. And uh, I'm not going to go more into the details, but I mean, there are, there are the formations of these simple models that can get all the way to 10 to the 16. No? But what's nice here is that no matter how hard you work, you're always predicting something for the next generation of CMB experiments. So even if you have this scaling, you're still going to populate nearby sectors a little bit which means that you're going to predict some amount of radiation that should be detected in the future. And I think that uh, really the rock bottom value that you cannot do without is roughly comparable to the sensitivity of the next generation experiments that should be start taking data in five to 10 years. So if you don't see any of this, and naturalness is dead, if you see it, 
Of course, this is not the only explanation, but you can keep hoping. And the way you can concretely do something <clears throat> to follow up on your hope is to look at neutrinos, because not only you're going to generate extra radiation, but you're also going to put some energy density into the neutrinos of the other sectors. Which in practice means some consequence of the CM for the CMB that I'm not gonna go into the details. But uh, if you have infinite resolution, it would be very spectacular. You would really see little stairs in the matter power spectrum that nothing else can generate. <clears throat> but anyway, let's, let's not dwell on this too much. Uh, finally, one more thing to be aware of is that of course this coupling is tiny, so it has to scale like some power of n. So you're never gonna see directly uh, these reheaton fields at colliders. Okay, so this is uh, an example in the third category. You see that uh, these models uh, started simple and beautiful and then got ugly while confronting experiments, while these models start ugly by construction with this huge number of copies. But a priori, this is not necessarily a good reason to discard them. Um, how am I doing? That's it? Okay. So I'm glad I, I, I managed to make at least one example per, per category. Uh, well, I think you're not gonna miss the usual Susie lecture. You must have heard it a million times. Well, it would have been nice to talk about the relaxation, but uh, well, next time. So in conclusion, there is really no conclusion. <laughs> we have a very deep problem. We have no idea what the right solution is. So many people are, 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 are depressed because the LHC is not finding anything, they're crying and they're sad, but I'm incredibly happy because I would have died if I had to do 10 years of supersymmetry spectroscopy in the rest of my career. Instead, I have a truly deep problem that is facing me and I have no idea what the solution is. So maybe I'm not gonna find a job, but at least I'm gonna be happy while I don't, instead of being miserable and with a tenured position. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.